Nintendo and Minakuchi Engineering Solar Striker on Game Boy, released in 1989, or 1990 preferably. Rob Hall, if you're watching this, this is for you. Before we start things off, not only am I dedicating this to Rob Hall himself, but to the rest of the BitBar staff, Clark, Koltoff, Allen, Zicky, Spackman, Malin, and others. Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, Justin and Jordan Peterson, Alana Gordon, Deborah Fletchner, Judy and Gwen, Taylor Copeland, Alyssa Brock, Kim Tran, Sharon Jitnick, Maggie O'Neill, Erica Morricone, Katie Solomon, Liz Stapleton, Carly Lieberman, Jess DeFelice, aka Astol, an independent model, fantasy cosplayer, and social media influencer from Maine, Ray Vasquez from Ray of Sunshine and Zeratopoulos, formerly known as The Lava Buster from Connecticut, Bella aka Girl with Yellow Spoon from LA, Kayla aka Plum Drop 11, Kinsey Burke aka Kinzilla, Chris Bennett aka The Mount Vernon Kid, Chavez Slovakia, Stop Skeletons from Fighting, Tomashi Hiroka, Riley Sky 100, Celine Chen aka The Underwater Ventriloquist, Autumn Lee Bales aka Old School Gamer Mama from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, James Rolfe and Mike Matei from Cinema Massacre, Neil Crockett from Game Zone also in Salem, Dominic Cerulli from Sudden Impact in Winthrop, Joe Santulli from Digital Press in Clifton, New Jersey, Boston Open Screen, Healy Van Voris Atwood and Arabian, Word Local Film Festival, Levine, Burke, Rolke, and others, Jules Carrazza from Gen Y Films and Goliath Post, Bill Campbell from Insane Apricot, Anime Boston, Independent Film Festival Boston, Japan Festival Boston, Star Lab Studios, Rango Studios, Catalyst Comedy, and finally, Not For Resales Kevin James and Tom Chow for Dramen. With these out of our system, onto the game's main premise. Send the year 2159, that's roughly a century and a half from now. The Earth Federal Government has just been established, thereby linking the people of the common government against other opposing species. As part of this new addition, and to defend the peace and safety of the human race, the Earth Federation Army, or EFA for short, was also established. The Army wasted no valuable time going on the offensive, pursuing and attacking a faraway star known as Turin, surrounded and guarded by the dark forces of Reticulon, but the EFA was no match for their overwhelming combat power, and Earth's fate seemed sealed. Despite this, a top-secret mobile unit developed a very advanced space fighter in Earth's last fortification. Flying aboard said space fighter, hence their mothership, Mother Athena, aka the titular Solar Striker, the army arrived at the Turin solar system as the last chance for a violent, final retaliation against those bastard Reticulon forces. Regarding the gameplay, what do you know? Another godforsaken top few shmup, and as tragic as it is to point out, a mediocre yet somewhat decent and straightforward one. Shit, at least it's better than fucking Taito Space Invaders, but not only do I digress, I'll let everyone be the judge of that. Within which are helming the aforementioned Mother Athena Space Fighter, eradicating the shit out of every Reticulon assailant in your way. Namely all the Rotomechs, Cruisers, Harriers, Midi-Trons, Protodroids, Batwings, Pinchers, Arrowheads, Zigzags, Vexers, Warhawks, Anthrops, Octopods, Torques, which have piss all to do with dancing by the way, Scarabs, Blazers, Skimbots, Max and Terror Cannons, and boosting up its offensive means wherever and however necessary. Your D-pad, of course, hovers the craft in any direction, while B and A are for firing its main blaster cannon. The only item you'll be obtaining throughout the journey is a multi-level weapon power capsule marked P, summoned from a dispatched power pod no less, which levels up said cannon, speed and strength-wise, by 4 points upon each chain of acquisitions, specifically one level upon the first acquisition, and the latter two being achieved upon acquiring the last four, in other words, two per level. And upon inadvertently having your craft blown to fuck all, it's demoted to one point per death, Oh, and don't expect any speed boosters here, cause there aren't any, shit, no! To be completely honest, there really isn't much more to each of the six stage areas or your ship's attack capabilities, apart from the enemy lineups and the obvious top view landscape alterations, not to mention, pfft, isn't it obvious? The fucking end boss altercations with the following targets. Epicon, Destructor, Ultra Crusher, and the remaining quote-unquote Reticulon Trifecta of massive cores. Even if you don't destroy any of them, except maybe either one of the latter two or three, you'd still end up hauling ass for the next stage, at which point the same procedure repeats itself like a goddamn jack-in-the-box. The controls are literally a walk in the park to get acquainted with, as long as you're keeping a distinct, watchful eye on every pattern, and the gameplay cycle, to say the very least, is very tolerable and prudent. <laughs> Challenge-wise, for those trying to write this criminally underrated portable shmup off as a cakewalk, you're really shooting yourself in the motherfucking foot. 
While the first two areas are a heavenly slice of key lime slash red velvet hybrid meringue pie, if there ever existed one. Upon reaching the third stage and onward, expect the shit to really hit the fan, cause the enemy and projectile patterns can really throw you off faster than an actual fencing and or kendo tournament. Not that I've ever actually participated in them, but once again, I digress. There's also random mini-boss confrontations that occur throughout the latter half of your interstellar quest, specifically Omniquad, Xenocrypt, and the Quasi-Obliterator. And believe it or not, I honestly wish I was making those the fuck up, during which your senses have to be really on the ball, or they'll make you their bitch for life at a much faster rate than the likes of Gerard Butler, Anne Robinson, Peter Dinklage, and Gordon fucking Ramsay combined. Ditto for the non-stop enemy armadas. Did I forget to mention that you need to be fully powered up as possible before that very juncture, and that there's a much difficult version to access upon surviving your first run by pushing select, during which the ferocity of all enemy attacks are jacked the fuck up from 45% to 150% and twice the speed of a goddamn meteorite? However, starting with only two lives and absolutely no continues whatsoever, despite being able to accumulate more of the former by scoring 50,000 points, I wouldn't get too crestfallen should any tough confrontation turn out to be a living hell beyond even the imagination of Toshio Maeda himself, and for those wondering, yes, he's the mastermind responsible for various erotic-themed horror sci-fi stories including Orozuki Doji, Yoji Kyoshitsu or Demon Beast Invasion, Inju Gakuen, La Blue Girl, and Adventure Kid fame. Simplistic as the graphics are, even for an almost 30-year-old handheld title, the presentation, hence that the graphics, is somewhere in so-so territory, but definitely not atrocious. Your main ship has been rendered with a decent touch, notwithstanding its lack of any additional frames, unlike in Gunnack, or on the flip side, Namco Bandai's Galaxian and Galaga. Look what hits they fucking turn out to be, as have the numerous groups of enemies you go up against, the latter of which turn out to be monotonous after a while, with the obvious exception of the end bosses. The top view landscape variations are also far from a bland ass mess of blemishes, except maybe the first stage set in space, as they range from lush and alluring to flat out pragmatic and avant garde, with the latter two serving as a way for the player to really catch a glimpse of what's really taking effect around them, or him or her, whatever. Need the Christ I say more for pissing out loud? As far as music and sound, composed by the one and only Toru Osada, the contrasting collection of tunes heard throughout are a true blessing on the ears in spite of how redundant they turn out to be, and one of which was heard on Captain N later that same year. Fun fact for all the 90s veterans out there. While some are reused and altered in between every stage or two, the same boss theme is reused for every confrontation, except for the final. I honestly motherfucking wish I could say the same about the participating sound effects, however. Don't get me wrong, they're not that appalling. But let's face it, although they do have their moments, in reality they're too goddamn vexatious to bear after a while and can really drone over you for an unreasonable period of time. Then again, I might just be talking way too far out of my own ass. And before I go any further, take note of my personal favorites displayed here. Replayability-wise, notwithstanding the unorthodox as fuck design choices, not to mention how often you'll be facing and enduring the same challenges in between each playthrough without any chance of continuation, depending on your best possible judgment, as I outlined once in my Halo Wars review, number 14, back in Season 2, Solar Striker is definitely worth something you'll be jetting your way the hell back through time and time again. Therefore, on one hand, you'd be high off your ass to pass this up, but then again on the other, you're better off with something else. Nemesis, I'm looking at you. Henceforth, what's my final verdict? It's easy to see why, as I've mentioned with every other overlooked title, console, handheld, digital, who gives a shit? This wasn't fairly received nowadays, compared to almost 30 years ago. For the sake of avoiding any broken record tax, however, if you've still got your Game Boy or any other variation, including the Super Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy Player for the GameCube, or like the fuck thereof, and are on the market for a super fun, super quick, and super unforgiving, if in some cases equitable, shmup guaranteed for an on-the-go, anti-boredom experience like no other, look no further than Solar Striker. By all means, scope it out like Somerville's Prospect Hill Tower, which I've been visiting often, by the way. Even taking its cheap-ass prices and somewhat common frequency into consideration, believe it or not, there won't be any lament whatsoever in doing so. Until then, my beloved viewers, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God proudly signing off.